looking at me Now I'm gone, now I'm gone, now I'm gone Welcome to our MJ Podcast. We are coming to you from our home office in Plattsburgh, New York. My name is Mark, and I will be your host for this MJA public service announcement, which is Part 10. MJA has added four new cases to our case files. Those cases are Case 1, The Death of of Marcus Merritt Sr. MJA become consultants on this case in March 2014. Mr. Merritt was found deceased on January 4, 2013 at his residence located in Leonville, Louisiana. Mr. Merritt was discovered by his in-laws in his bedroom from what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. At this point is where the red flags started to appear. The in-laws were directed to the residence by their daughter who was married to Mr. Merritt. The reason being Mr. Mrs. Merritt was at work at a local hospital and her and Mr. Merritt was talking and texting on their cell phones in what witnesses described as an argument. Witnesses says Mrs. Merritt's last words to Mr. Merritt were, well you just need to kill yourself. 
At this time, Mrs. Merrick claims she heard a loud noise and the phone went dead. Here is Mrs. Merritt at the hospital. Instead of contacting the EMTs that there might be something wrong at her residence, she called her parents to go over and check on Mr. Merritt. When her parents discovered Mr. Merritt's body, they called 911. In return, a parish sheriff deputy arrived at the scene. The in-laws placed another call, which was to the chief of police of Leonville. The police chief, Joseph Noel, arrived at the scene and waved off the parish deputy, saying he was a family friend and he would handle the investigation. The parish deputy left the scene. At some point, the chief of police was talking to the medical examiner and explained the scene, and it was ruled a suicide. The medical examiner sent his attendants to the scene, and they took Mr. Merritt's body straight to the funeral home. There was no gunshot residue done on Mr. Merritt's hands to see if he had even fired a gun. There was no autopsy or talk screen done on Mr. Merritt, and there was no death investigation conducted. Mr. Merritt's mother, Royce Eckley, never believed her son killed himself. The reason being, she had spent the Christmas holiday with the Merritt family, and everything was fine with her son. Mr. Merritt was days away from leaving his wife and moving back to Texas and he had already secured a job in Texas and was planning on getting back with an ex-girlfriend. Things just weren't adding up to Miss Royce and she reached out to MJA for help. The victim's mother, Royce Eckley, had a goal and that was to have her son's body exhumed, to have an autopsy and talk screen done and to have a death investigation conducted that wasn't done after her son was found deceased. After MJA had read over the paperwork Miss Royce had and reading the interviews she conducted with the funeral director and Mr. Merritt's barber who cut Mr. Merritt's hair for burial, more red flags appeared. The funeral director and the barber never seen any signs of a gunshot wound. They seen no entrance or exit wound for someone who was said to have put a 32 caliber pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. MJA, with the help of Together We Stand out of California, started picking away at the state's claim that Mr. Merritt had killed himself. MJA filed five Freedom of Information Acts to gain more information and those filings were ignored. It's a fact when it's ruled a suicide. There is no ongoing investigation so there is no need for the state of Louisiana to hide any information concerning the case. MJA, with the help of Together We Stand, produced enough evidence that on June 2, 2016, Mr. Merritt's body was exhumed. An autopsy and tox screen was done on Mr. Merritt's body and a death investigation was conducted. In December 2016, the Louisiana State Police produced a report that was a half a page long what their findings were, and they once again ruled it a suicide. Well, that wasn't good enough for MJA or good enough for the victim's mother. We wanted all the paperwork and photos concerning this death investigation. After filing motion after motion, 
the state of Louisiana around June 2017 granted our request. After receiving a flash drive from the Louisiana State Police with all the information we requested only raised more questions and more red flags. In return, we reached out to experts to view the evidence to see what their findings would be. Five medical examiners and three mechanical engineers done reports on the evidence and their findings were that this was a homicide. Our goal is to have a death inquest or a grand jury to hear and view the evidence that is in question. The case has heated up and that is when MJA decided to add Mr. Merritt's case to our case files. Mr. Merritt became our 98th case. Our investigation into the death of Marcus Merritt Sr. continues. Case 2. Jessica Elliott. On December 30th, 2015, 37-year-old Jessica Elliott was at her residence in Richmond, Indiana, laying on the couch and was found unresponsive by her live-in boyfriend, Curtis Smith, after he had exited the bathroom in their home. Mr. Smith called 911. And when the EMTs arrived, Mr. Smith claimed he found Miss Elliott's prescribed medication bottle, Xanax, empty. The EMTs rushed Miss Elliott to the Richmond Hospital and they treated her for a drug overdose because of the information provided by her boyfriend, Curtis Smith. After being treated for the drug overdose for nine hours with no response, they transferred Miss Elliott to an Indianapolis hospital. This is where a nurse discovered injuries to Miss Elliott which could be consistent with abuse. The hospital staff noticed marks on Miss Elliott's neck and plus she had big bruises on her chest and her hands were beat up. A CAT scan revealed something even more ominous. Discovered from the CAT scan, Miss Elliot was suffering from two types of hematomas, which is consistent with blunt force trauma. At that time, it was too late for Miss Elliot because she was brain dead. The hospital called the Richmond, Indiana Police Department to report their findings. According to police and autopsy reports, Miss Elliott suffered trauma to her brain. Doctors say it was bleeding in two places, but it went undetected for nearly nine hours because Curtis Smith, her live-in boyfriend, told emergency crews she overdosed on her prescribed Xanax. When the police questioned Curtis Smith, he told police that there was an argument which turned into a wrestling match, but he said Miss Elliot was the aggressor and that's why he was in the bathroom to escape her abuse. The Marion County Coroner's Office conducted an autopsy. Dr. John Cavanaugh was the pathologist. Dr. Cavanaugh determined Miss Elliott died from complications of two types of hematomas. But the manner of death, Dr. Cavanaugh ruled it undetermined despite the physical altercation between Elliott and Smith where Smith admitted to roughly manhandling Miss Elliott. Just as troubling, the autopsy did not find even a trace of Xanax in her system. The toxicology report revealed just a small amount of THC related to marijuana and the drug Prozac. 
The Barron County pathologist ignored the facts from the police report and to the hospital findings, which allowed a possible murder suspect to go free. This outcome didn't set well with Miss Elliott's mother, Diane Elliott, and she launched her own investigation. That's where she learned that Dr. Cavanaugh had been fired from Chicago, Illinois because during an autopsy, he missed signs of a homicide. The state of Illinois is reviewing 219 cases where Dr. Cavanaugh conducted the autopsies. The Marin County Coroner's Office also revealed for the first time it is reviewing all of Dr. Cavanaugh's homicide cases from over the past year. For two and a half years, Diane Elliott has been pushing to get Dr. Cavanaugh's findings reviewed and changed. Now, the Richmond Police Chief is demanding the same and confirmed that he sent a letter to the Marion County Coroner asking for a review of Miss Elliott's case. The Chief Deputy Coroner confirmed Jessica Elliott's case is one of those in Marion County to get reviewed. The investigation into the death of Jessica Elliott continues. Jessica Elliott became our 100th case. Let's take a pause for the cause and when we, we when we return, we will tell you about the other two cases we have added to our case files. We will be back in a moment. MJA would like to give a special shout out to the Corbin Connection Comedy Channel on YouTube. Mr. Corbin is a very funny man with his three alder egos. Once again, that's the Corbin Connection on the Comedy Channel on YouTube. Check it out. Thank you. Welcome back to our MJA podcast. 
This is a MJ Public Service Announcement, Part 10. Now on to our other two cases. Case 3, The Death of Tiffany Tweedy. On June 7, 2018, the lifeless body of 35-year-old Tiffany Tweedy was found on Lust Road, located in Orange County, Florida. The Orange County Medical Examiner ruled Miss Tweedy's death as an accidental overdose of drugs, including fentanyl and heroin. Orange County Sheriff deputies are investigating the circumstances of Tweedy's death, and the death investigation is active and ongoing. The agency has released few details and deputies have not explained how Tweedy arrived at the remote site under State Road 429 overpass on Lust Road. The Orange County Sheriff's Office has refused to discuss Tweedy's death. The Orange County Sheriff's Office says it makes the investigation kind of difficult at this time because we don't know how Tweedy got there, if she went there on her own, or if somebody left her there. Tiffany Tweedy was on probation and she was arrested on a probation violation and a judge ordered Tweedy to enroll in the Steps Incorporated, a substance abuse program licensed by the State Department of Children and Families. The judge gave Tweedy 24 hours to report to the Steps Incorporated, which she did as ordered. Steps Incorporated is a residential center for women and is about 5.5 miles away from where Tweedy's body was found. It's a fact that Tiffany Tweedy couldn't leave the residential center unless she was with an officer of the courts or a staff member from the residential center or a family member in which they would have to sign her out and sign her back in. Denise Payton, who is the mother of Tiffany Tweedy, warned the court and the staff incorporated, the Steps Incorporated staff, that Marvin Kemp was her daughter's drug dealer and she should be, and there should be a separation order in place so he couldn't visit her daughter at the residential center. After Denise Payton, the mother of the victim, learned of her daughter's death, she launched her own investigation. Payton gained video footage from the residential center for the night of June 7, 2018, and at about the 12.47 a.m. mark of the video, it clearly shows her daughter, Tiffany Tweedy, exiting the Steps Incorporated residential center, but she wasn't alone. Walking out with her was her daughter's known drug dealer, Marvin Kemp, and some six hours later, Tiffany Tweedy was found dead. But yet, Marvin Kemp hasn't been questioned by the police, claiming they don't have probable cause to do so. In my 40 plus years as an investigator, I have never, I have never known or heard of having probable cause to question someone. If that was the case, the probable cause in my book would be the video footage of Marvin Kemp walking out of the Steps Incorporated Residential Center about six hours before Tiffany Tweedy's lifeless body was discovered. Tiffany Tweedy became our 101st case. The investigation into the death of Tiffany Tweedy continues. Case 4 The Wrongful Conviction of Jerome Ski Smith. It was October 29, 19. 
85 in New Orleans, Louisiana, where an unidentified killer fatally shot Bill Long, a father of six and owner of Bill Long's Bakery, during an alleged robbery. There were several witnesses to the shooting, and every one of them had a different account as to what happened and the description of the shooter. On October 30, 1985, the police arrested a black teenager, 15-year-old Jerome Ski Smith, who was an upcoming high school basketball star for robbery and murder. The Smith family was regular customers of the bakery. In 1986, Jerome Ski Smith, at the age of 16 years old, was convicted by an all-white jury of the crime and was sentenced to life without parole. It didn't matter that one of the witnesses described the killer as five foot one inches tall with an afro and another witness claimed the killer had straight hair when in fact Jerome Ski Smith was six foot one inches tall and his hair was in jerry curls at the time. The crime took place a little after 4 p.m. but no later than 4.30 p.m. and police records claim the crime took place around 4.15 p.m. It didn't matter that a service station attendant testified that Jerome and his mother had stopped for 10 minutes to get gas which he checked the oil and other fluids and tire pressure at around 4 p.m. It didn't matter after leaving the service station, they arrived at the Youth Study Center at 4.15 p.m. for a scheduled appointment with a child psychologist. Many witnesses saw Jerome and his mother at the Youth Study Center and they testified at his murder trial. It didn't matter what was revealed in 2001 that evidence hidden by a prosecutor in 1986 came to light. It turned out that the three witnesses who testified against Smith in court gave different tape recorded descriptions of the murder right after the shooting. Even more damaging to the prosecution was none of these three witnesses could pick Jerome Ski Smith out of a photo array lineup right after he was arrested. They all used the words like, well, it looks like him, or he looks a lot like the killer. But during his trial, they gave a positive ID of Smith being the killer. Our goal is to find more evidence that will be compelling enough to get Jerome Ski Smith, a new trial that is fair and just. Our investigation into this case just started. Jerome Ski Smith is our 102nd case. I have a quote for our listeners. Patience is the companion of wisdom. St. Augustine. Always remember, folks, if you ever get bored with nothing to do, well, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised what you might find. That's the end of our MJA Public Service announcement. I want to thank you all for listening in. My name is Mark. I was your host for tonight's podcast. And I say to all of you, good night from Plattsburgh, New York.
welcome to the rooms of people who have rules for people that they love one day docked away just because you check the guns at the door doesn't mean the brains will change from hand to nay you'll never know a psychopath sitting as you you'll never know a murderer sitting as you you'll think how we get here sitting as you but after all i've said please don't forget Thanks, Melly, your intention.